In this video, I'm going to show you all the important details of installing a hardwood floor for your first time. This is going to allow you to get results like you're a pro, but it's going to be broken down for a DIYer or a first time installer. So these are the tools you're going to need to install your hardwood floors. First off, we've got the hearing protection. You're going to be listening to very loud gunshot like sounds for a long time. Next, we've got the safety glasses, especially when you're using the table saw, the jigsaw, any of those saws, it's going to be spitting straight at your eyes. You got to have them and the knee pads. They're optional, but you're going to be feeling your knees by the end. These are some nice uh, professional knee pads. I'll put a link to them down below. These are the saws you need if you want your life to be easy, but you do not have to have all of them. We've got our table saw here. You got to make your rips. Here we've got a jigsaw and an oscillating saw. The oscillating saw can do all the things that the jigsaw can do, but this will speed you up a lot when you're making cuts around vents and door frames. This you must have to undercut your door jams. We've got our miter saw. In theory, you could do this with a circular saw. I wouldn't, especially if you're going to be doing any picture framing or have to cut any angles. Here we've got our soft headed hammer. We got to have this for hitting our nail gun and to keep us from breaking our boards while we pound them in. You can see we have a few different types of pry bars here. The one you absolutely have to have though is this flat bar. The others are optional. This wall jack here though is not optional. You need this to close your gaps. This is an Amazon one and I'll drop a link to it down below. As far as nailers go, we have a manual cleat nailer here. We have a power cleat nailer here, an edge cleat nailer in the middle and a pin nailer right here. You're gonna need one main cleat or staple gun and you're gonna need the pin nailer. The edge nailer you see here is not available for rent, so unfortunately you'll have to do without that one. So before we start the install, we want to take a good look at our subfloor here and look for any high spots. If there's high spots, we're going to want to sand those down. You can use a floor edger, a palm sander, or a hand planer. You do want to get it pretty close. Anything over an eighth of an inch, definitely, if you can get it to a sixteenth or less, that's even better. We also want to Walk around checking for any squeaks in the floor. If when you walk, you hear a squeak, it's probably the plywood moving up and down from a nail coming loose. If you hear any of those, you can get the screws out, send a few screws in, it will usually quiet it up. So as you can see, we've got the baseboards off over here. Unless there's some special circumstance, you always take the baseboard off when you're installing hardwood floor. And you want to know what trim is going back on. Are you just doing baseboard? If so, that's usually going to be five eighths of an inch thick, meaning your boards must all be that close or closer. If you're doing baseboard and shoe mold, it might be more than that. But just know whatever it is you're going to be using so you can keep your gap within those limits. As you can see, we've taken the casings off around the door. You don't have to do this. You could also undercut them. But in this case, they're being replaced. Now these jams here, they must be undercut to three quarters of an inch to fit a solid hardwood floor underneath. You can see we have a pocket door here. It's going to fit over the floor, so we're not gonna mess with it. But normally, you always wanna take your doors off when you're installing. The joists run front to back in the house, and we only have one layer of plywood down. So we need to run our wood across those joists or else that floor is gonna move a lot more over time. So we're going to start out by running along the front wall of the house. You can usually trust an exterior wall to be pretty straight. That is not true with the interior walls. So you might consider checking your room for square, especially if it has no exterior walls in it. But if you have to run with one wall, always pick an exterior wall. Inside this gun, I've got Burger Seidel M1 sausage tubes. This is a glue specifically made for wood floors. So when it dries, it's going to be sticky, but it's still going to be flexible. Whereas if you were to use like a liquid nails, it dries very hard and it does not allow the floor to move. So we always want to glue our first few rows. We're going to loose fit these first few rows with the longest boards we can find. After I've got the row straight, I'm going to tack the back edges of the board, and I'm going to do this where the baseboard is going to sit over top of the nail holes. Then I'm going to come around and put nails through the tongue about every six to eight inches. 
we're then going to loosely fit the next row up to it. We're not going to tap too hard on anything yet because we could easily alter the entire line. Now you may be thinking, well isn't the wall going to hold the starter row in place? No, if you look closely, we have a small expansion gap there to allow the floor to expand and contract seasonally, and we always want that to be at least a quarter inch. That metal piece there is the threshold of the door, which we tucked the floor under because no trim is going to go there. You can see now that we're out to row three, we can fit the cleat gun in here. Since the first two rows are only held in by glue that is not dry and pin nails, I'm not going to be hitting the gun very hard. If I do, I can shift all three rows very easily. I'm going to be putting cleats in every six to eight inches, and one cleat is going to go on each end within two to three inches of the end. These are two inch long, 16 gauge cleats. Staples of a similar size would also be fine. So you can see the head on here is sunk down into the hole, and it broke a couple tongues. That means we need to turn our air pressure down. Different woods and different guns are going to require different air pressures. This is set at about 90 PSI. We're going to go down from there a little bit until the head just barely protrudes as we nail. A few broken tongues like this is not a big deal, but if you do it a lot, the floor will squeak. Sometimes you're going to get a poor swing on the gun or your air compressor has issues and a cleat or stable is not going to set. I would recommend having a metal blade ready on your oscillating tool. Just cut it off. Don't try to pry it. You'll just mess your board up. We're now going to put down some 15 pound roofing tar paper as our moisture retarder. And notice I didn't say barrier. It's not going to block the moisture. It's simply going to slow down its transfer. If it did block the moisture, then your subfloor would rot. So if a house has moisture problems, you cannot install hardwood in them until it's fixed. In a house like this, we're working over a nice dry basement. We don't have much moisture concerns, but over a crawl space house that has open earth underneath it, we're gonna be a lot more concerned about moisture. So let's go over some patterns to avoid when you're nailing the floor out. Right here, we have a stair step. All very similar spacing, and the further this grows, the worse it looks. So if you're gonna build this out, you'd be much better to have it look something more like this. That's no longer a stair step. You'll never see that in the floor. But when they're all evenly spaced, especially when they're close together, that doesn't look good. Now, over here, we have what we call an H joint. It's when you have two board ends that end right next to each other with one board in between. This can also exist with two boards in between. Not as bad, but still doesn't look great. You want your floor to be as random as possible. And the last thing we want to avoid is having board ends that are too close together. It just looks bad. That's way too close. Ob obviously never this. You always want to have at least one board width. Ideally, you'll have two board widths. Now we're just going to fly through this big open area, which we'll get into more later in the video. When you're moving real fast through an open space, it can be easy to nail boards into the floor that don't belong there. They're garbage. As you can see here, we have some oddly colored boards as well as some cracks and some chips, you're going to save yourself all sorts of headaches to just slow down, pull these out, and throw them away. So when it comes to using tar paper, there's one major downside to it, and it's how thick it is. This is 15 pound, but when we overlap here at the edges, it is thick enough to where this board is noticeably higher, and you have to hit them very hard to get them to go together. This results in a lot of broken tongues on the existing row and broken grooves on the back. It's just a huge hassle. So that's why I prefer something a little more like this aqua bar B here. Practically, I don't know that it's any better, but it's much thinner and you don't really have any of those problems putting the two of them together. You can see down here, we've stopped the tar paper. That's on purpose. We're gonna glue these last couple edges and obviously you can't glue to the tar paper. It wouldn't hold anything. We've come to the last row that we can use our main nailer on. So now we're gonna close the edge up. This is one of the harder skills of installing your hardwood floor. Just like with the starting rows, whenever we can't get our main cleat nailer in there, we're going to glue it. I'm going to use the wall jack to close any gaps and then I'm going to pin nail it through the tongue. 
I normally only use the pin nailer to top nail right at the edge. But since this is a DIY video, I want you to know how I would do it without the edge nailer. I'm gonna use this wall jack against every wall I work up to. It's a super important tool. Like I said, I'll put a link to it down below. This is a simple Amazon wall jack. Now, you gotta treat this thing with respect. It will punch straight through drywall if you're not jacking on a stud. And even if you are, you can move the whole wall. So sometimes you're gonna to need to spread its force out by putting a long piece of flooring up against the wall. Up against the wall here is a great place to use up some short boards. So you can see I'm putting out a bunch of, you know, 12 inch, 16 inch boards. They click together much more easily. And on top of that, it doesn't really catch the eye that used all the short boards there. This is one of the few times you're gonna see me using a tape measure on an install site. I find it by far the easiest though to just measure how big your gap is and then set the table saw to one quarter inch less than whatever the gap is and just make your rips. Now keep in mind, this rip can change as you go down. You're not necessarily coming up perfectly square with the wall. Now we did here, but in another part of the video, I'll show you what I do when we're coming up at an angle. As a hardwood installer, I use a table saw more than just about anybody else. And I keep my fingers back. Notice how I'm flipping the board. I am not ever letting my fingers get close. On this last row here, I'm going to use a little bit of wall jack, but mostly just pry bar. And as I shoot my nails in, I'm going to try to keep them to the far outside of the board where the holes will be covered by the baseboard and shoe mold so that I don't have to wood fill and worry about how they look. We're starting our new line in the hallway here. So as you may have guessed, we're gonna glue it. I'm now going to install the longest, straightest board I can here. I'm gonna put half of it on my existing floor and I'm gonna hang half of it free going past into the open. I'm gonna finish this row out all the way to the wall to where I can sight down the whole thing and see how straight it looks. I need to make sure that it looks straight coming down the hallway and I can do this just by looking or I can also check that it's running parallel with one of those walls. Just keep in mind they're not necessarily straight. Once we've got the starter row where we want it we're going to pin nail it into the joist and when I say pin nail I'm just referring to this style of gun. I realize these are not actually pin nails. This is a 15 gauge and we also use an 18 gauge at different points in this video. We're going to tack two nails in each part of the board that's going over the joist. And we know where the joists are by looking where the existing nails are and the existing plywood seams. If you see a row of nails or a line of plywood seams, you know there's a joist underneath. We're then going to run what we call our turnaround, which is simply putting a piece of spline, which is this really thin piece of wood here, in the back side of the board. When we do this, now we can run the flooring the other direction as well. It's good to put a little bit of wood glue on the spline to hold it in place. And also keep in mind not to tap too hard. You can move this starter line. We always glue our first turnaround board just to add a little bit of extra strength to that portion of the floor. It's frequently a little bit harder to get your first row in after you put the spline in. So expect to have to tap on it a good bit. I'm now going to show you how to work through different types of doorways. Tucking under door jams and door casings is one of the hardest things that you're going to have to do. With the way this door is situated with the floor, I cannot put a whole piece that surrounds the whole door frame here. I'm going to have to pound a piece in from each side. So I'm going to sort through all my random lengths of boards until I find one that will end right in the middle of the door frame so I can keep my tongue in groove. If you don't tuck at least 3 8 of an inch underneath the door jamb, expect there to be a gap at the bottom where your casing meets the floor. I'm now going to pound this under the casing and past the tongue on my existing floor. Then I'm going to gently tap it back in snug with the existing floor. I'm now going to repeat the exact same process on the other side, but this one will be much easier to install because I get to work away from the door jam instead of working towards it.
you can see I've got some numbers written here on my boards as we come up to the wall here. That's because I'm going to rip these to different widths. We're coming up at an angle, and instead of making taper cuts, which would take a long time, I'm going to just stair-step it down with slightly smaller boards, and it's going to save me a lot of time. Out here, where the hallway meets the kitchen, you can see I have a tongue on both sides. That's because we installed herringbone in the kitchen, and we put a border around it. So we're going to have to precisely cut each board to length, and then run the cut end through a router table to put a groove on it. Both ends of the board will then be grooved and we can tap it into place. But if this is your first install and you don't have a router table, this is probably a little advanced. Just use some glue underneath and you can skip the tongue and groove. And I thought I'd take a second here to show you what it's like running the manual nailer. You can see I'm using an extra heavy hammer and I'm really whacking on it to get those nails to drive. It can be done, but it's a lot harder of a job. I'm going to show you what it's like coming up to a doorway from the other direction now. And we left the casings on for you this time. It's important that you lay this out with three boards, and they all have to be 18 inches or shorter with one board that can easily come in and out from the middle. I'm going to start out by marking out my L cuts and making them on both sides. Now it's very important that you've laid all three boards out at one time because we're going to maintain our tongue and groove with every piece here. Doing it this way allows me to keep my tongue and groove and tuck underneath everything. If you use too long of boards, they won't fit in the doorway and you can't slide them underneath. If you use boards that will fit in the doorway but don't leave room to swing your hammer, many times you won't be able to pound them through. I know it looks like we're going to have a gap under our casing, but that casing is just cut really high because it's being ripped off later. When the final casing goes in, all gaps will be covered and it will look tight as can be. But we can't stop the floor here. We need it to end directly under the door, and we want a real nice straight line for the tile guy. So we're going to measure a piece that will be long enough to tuck under both ends and finish right in the middle of the door. So we're going to measure the width of our doorway Add a little bit to it so that the ends tuck under and out of sight. And then we're going to measure to the middle of our door. We're going to make sure that it's coming up parallel because we would taper this cut if we had to. But we were good in this case. So we just got our dimensions and made the cut. Now I'm going to give you a few tips for nailing the wide open spaces. It's not incredibly difficult, but there's a few things that will speed you up. For one, if you have something difficult to work around, start at the difficult item and work away from it. You can see here, I am now starting on the side where I have to router my ends and I'm working away from it. The next thing I'll tell you is, these boards are going to fight you while they're going together. You've got to get your end joints tight as well as the long joints. Start by getting your end or butt joints tight. Once you have clipped the board in long ways, it's almost impossible to slide the end joint tight if it's not already. There's just so much friction. The next thing I'd say is, if something's really fighting you and it doesn't want to go together, take it apart, look down inside. You might have a cracked tongue. There might be a cleat sticking out. There's usually a reason. The wider the boards get, the harder it's going to be to click your boards together. So I'd highly recommend going with a higher quality mill if you're going to do some real wide plank. I'm talking about anything north of 4 inches. Most of these nail guns are set up to nail from left to right, pulling the gun behind you in your left hand and swinging with your right. You're going to want to run your rows in the same direction as much as you can. You've got to be super attentive to when your gun runs out of nails. A lot of times it will act about the same when it's dry firing. So pay good attention if you notice your boards are not sticking shut or the sound changes just a little. Check to make sure there's nails showing. I've seen people nail row after row not realizing there's no nails going in. Then you have to tear it out. The last thing I want you to note before I show the final product is the numbers I have marked on the boards down there. I'm pre-racking the floor. In wide open spaces, this will save you a ton of time. It's simply loose laying the floor in the pattern you want to nail it in. You leave about a 5 inch gap between your floor that's already nailed 
and the loose floor called your rack. If you do it real tight, you can even go pre-mark and cut five or six boards at a time and have the floor just ready to nail in. We decided not to video the herringbone because it's a little bit more of an advanced skill, but comment down below if that's something you'd like to see. Many parts of your house are not meant to last that long. Even the sanding and finishing will last maybe 10 years. But this installation, this will be around 100 years from now. So if there's one place to really focus your attention, your details, and your money, it's in the installation process of your floor. Acclimate the wood. Make sure it's tight. Use the proper fasteners. Don't rush. And you'll thank yourself later. If you like this video, guys, please subscribe.